Hey guys, welcome to the Tuesday Tune. My name's Steve and I run Vosprong Suspension up here in Whistle, BC. This week, we're going to have a look at the way that air springs work in general. So when I say air springs, I'm talking about a system uh, that will have a positive spring and a negative spring. In this case, we're going to look at uh, predominantly the positive spring. The negative spring uh, can be a, a coil or an air sprung setup, depending on what fork or shock it is. So we're going to have a look at the way that the that the spring generates its actual force uh, and how what the resultant curve of that is so your spring rate and how to adjust that in a manner that is actually suitable and useful for what you're doing so let's have a look first at the standard configuration of any air spring that is to have a positive chamber and a negative chamber so we have here uh, a basically a dummy shock one that we keep around the shop for uh, testing fitment and whatnot with one of our own air sleeves on it. So inside this air spring system, you have a positive chamber, which is this top half here. There's a piston inside, which I'll show you in a sec, and a negative chamber down the bottom. You can see where the air piston starts on this one, a uh, little way into the stroke of, well, the available bore, I should say, really, of the air spring. So you have air trap behind it, that negative spring. You have air in front of it, the positive spring. Both of those will equalize at a point in the travel uh, inside this air can, um, which is calculated such that the pressure in the negative chamber balances out the, pre the pressure in the positive chamber um, at top out. It doesn't mean there'll be the same pressure. The negative chamber will actually be a higher pressure because it has a smaller surface area. When the thing first starts to compress, the positive chamber is changing in volume. The pressure that's in the positive chamber changes along with that volume in inverse proportion. So if you halve the chamber volume, you roughly double the pressure if we're moving slowly. The opposite is happening in the negative chamber. As that expands, the pressure is dropping off. And it's that expansion in the initial stroke that basically means that you have a difference between the positive pressure and the negative pressure, a substantial difference. So that's what controls our initial spring rate. The second part that we're going to talk about, uh, and this is the part that realistically the end user can, the rider can tune the most, is the volume of the positive chamber along with its uh, pressure. So in a lot of forks and shocks now, we have volume spaces like this. This one's out of a float X, this is one we actually make here. There's ones like this for the Fox 40. Uh, these are some of the Rock Shocks ones out of a Pike or a Boxer. Um, and this one out of a 34, I believe. The purpose of these volume spaces is that we can control the compression ratio of the fork and that means what the initial volume of the positive chamber is relative to the, the ending volume. Usually that will be somewhere around the about 3 to 1. When the pressure is being compressed in the positive chamber, initially the percentage change in, uh, in volume is so small that it's really only the drop off in pressure from the negative chamber that controls the overall spring rate because the spring force is the sum of the positive uh, spring force acting in one direction and the negative spring force acting in the other. And so if that negative spring force drops off, then the positive spring force generates a higher net force in that direction, even though the positive pressure hasn't actually changed that much in the start of the travel. And that's why uh, larger negative chamber air spring systems like the corset are able to give you something that is a lot more linear, a lot more like a coil spring. It will never be a coil spring, but it's a lot closer. Anyway, let's have a look at some volume space characteristics. Because there is quite a bit to consider here, uh, basically to do with the way that we consider force, energy storage in the spring, and the relationship between the two. And that means that we have to consider each time we adjust the volume, what we're going to do with the pressure. Are we going to keep the pressure the same, or are we going to change it? Let's have a look at some graphs. I know everyone loves nerding out about graphs. Let's have a look at uh, curves here showing um, the spring characteristic of a particular fork. This is from a pike, uh, but it's applicable to pretty much everything because the principles are universal. So let's have a look at this according to the number of uh, tokens in there. So more tokens obviously taking up more space, meaning we're compressing air into a smaller volume at the end of the stroke. All these with the same starting pressure. As you can see in the first inch of travel, there's not a huge difference in the spring curve. And that's because, as I said, that is predominantly dictated by the negative spring. Uh, 
As we get further into the middle, the curves start to diverge further and further. When we get to the end, there's a really huge difference. So looking at three inches, uh, we go from, let's have a look, what are we at about, let's say 100 pounds with no tokens, and we are at 120 pounds with three tokens. So we're looking at about a 20% difference, the same pressure halfway through the travel between no tokens and four tokens in this case. However, at the end of the travel, we're looking at a difference of 214 pounds to, what's this, 477. Pretty big difference, more than 100%. So, what we can see from that, obviously, is that the difference is much larger at the end of the stroke than it is at the start. So, for the first half of the travel difference, it's noticeable by the middle of the travel, but it's not that big. So, if this is, goes back to what I was saying, if you just put volume spaces in there uh, without adjusting the pressure, and you run the same pressure as you did before, it's going to be a bit firmer everywhere in the stroke. So, let's then have a look at what happens if we drop the pressure a bit as we go uh, to more like a larger volume spacer, so smaller actual air chamber volume. So this these curves here show what happens if you uh, set it up in such a way that the, uh, the force generated by each spring, each spring configuration I should say, is the same three inches into the travel. We are using uh, inches on the x-axis and pounds on the y-axis here because I felt like regressing to the Stone Ages and using the Imperial system. So at three inches here, everything is normalized to 110 pounds or thereabouts. What we can see in the early stroke is that that means that the configuration with four tokens is actually a bit softer. At the end of the stroke, it's still quite a bit stiffer. So in this case, however, the difference between the spring characteristics uh, early in the stroke is really not so large. We're not seeing the same percentage difference that we were before in the middle of the stroke. So this illustrates that by putting a larger token in and dropping the pressure slightly, uh, the pressures are listed here on the right hand side of the screen. That illustrates that we can drop the pressure at the same time that we decrease the volume available, the air volume, by putting more tokens or more spaces or whatever it is in there and have a fairly comparable early stroke. Or realistically, the first two thirds of the stroke is pretty similar and then have big variations at the end. The consequence of this is that you can effectively set up your fork uh, or shock to feel good in the first two thirds of the travel. So that means what I look for is something that feels like it has good bump compliance, is lively, is supportive, uh, all the sort of things that we typically associate with good suspension performance, except for worrying about bottom out or how much travel I'm using. So what we do then, once we have that set up, is we then play with the volume spacer configuration because then we know we only need to make small changes to the air pressure after this. So between zero tokens here at 76 psi and four tokens at 64 psi, we're only seeing a 12 psi difference, which in this case is 20%, but it's 20% variation uh, even though we are 20% variation in pressure despite seeing you know close to 100% variation in ending stroke force. So the force required to bottom it out. So then let's look at uh, the scenario that we have a big impact, but that the rider can hold on to very rigidly, let's say. Uh, and that would basically mean that there is a certain amount of energy, you know, landing a big jump, let's say you land with your arms and legs locked out for some stupid reason, you really hate your spine or something. And then there is a certain amount of energy being pushed into the suspension that has to be dissipated by uh, the damper and absorbed by the spring. Let's ignore the damping aspect of that for the moment. So the spring here, these curves are all calculated so that the area under the curve uh, is the same for each one. And that shows how the profile with which each of these spring curves would, adjust, uh, would absorb that energy. So as you can see, again, the most progressive one is the one with the most tokens. Uh, and these are the respective pressures over here on the right required to achieve that. And so this would be a reasonable criterion with which to set up your suspension um, if human beings were rigid but we're not we're part of the suspension and so the higher this force gets the more your body will give uh, there's simply no way around that even you know unless the forces were really low in which case we'd be bottoming out really easily but basically the peak force is going to be very similar to the person's peak strength 
Uh, if you set it up again so that that force is much higher than what a person can actually hold on to, you'll simply never use full travel, regardless of how much energy it does or does not absorb, because it will just force the rider to absorb more. However, using this as an ideal example, you can see here that we can get the same amount of energy absorption with lower force in the first two thirds of the travel uh, by using a more progressive setup with more tokens. Take it too far, we end up with something that feels terrible. Um, because it ramps up really suddenly. And again, here we see a difference, you know, at that, again, hypothetical 100 pound sag uh, force on the wheel, one and a quarter inches with no tokens, and 2.3 inches at, uh, with four tokens. So it's quite a difference in the amount of sag that you run as well. That means less positive travel to, available to deal uh, with big hits before you're in the higher force region of the, um, of the spring curve and that can create harshness in itself. So the solution to spring based harshness isn't always to soften. Sometimes it can be to stiffen it up so that you actually and go to a more linear setup so that you have something that has more travel available to absorb the impact. Because if you know if you only have one inch of travel available because you're running so much sag and then it just ramps up like crazy, it's gonna hurt. It really is. And so there is a balance to be struck here. Anyway, guys, that's about it for this week. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about something that is actually quite relevant to this, um, but more to do with the damper and the way that that interacts with your spring. Anyway, in the meantime, I hope you have learned something new or given you some kind of food for thought. Uh, feedback and comments always welcome. And until next week, see you then.